Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the session, part of the hot topic this afternoon, uh, the parallel session on blockchain slash technology. So I got a couple of questions from participants. What's the difference between the two sessions? Uh, very roughly speaking, here we will discuss how to build, implement, et cetera, et cetera, blockchain type systems. Um, how to make them work, how to make them optimal, how to prove their correctness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the other session is on applications, assuming that all this works, what can you do with it? Um, why is it interesting? What is attractive about this? We will have three speakers in this session. Um, each speaker will have one half hour allotted, 25 minutes typically for presentation, five minutes for Q&A, and we hope we can uh, sort of keep this. Um, our first speaker is uh, Donald Kosman. Um, he is an, well, not so old, I was just going to say old friend of mine, but no. uh, I'm older, so. <laughs> um, anyway, um, at some point back in this history, he was a professor for database, uh, databases in Heidelberg University. He then moved on to uh, Zurich, uh, to ETH, and now he is manager of the research division of uh, Microsoft up in Redmond. Um, but still, he is a very technical person, despite being the manager right now, um, and he will talk about uh, blockchain technology from a, let's say, systems-oriented perspective, sort of an introduction uh, to uh, this afternoon's session. Donald, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Andreas. And as I said, I have a very special relationship, although I never actually taught in this uh, lecture room. I was on the other side of the river. Um, but of course, it feels uh, great to be home again. Um, so, uh, Silvio already gave a very a great technical story about blockchain and he actually started with the question what is blockchain that was actually literally what he said uh, when he started his talk what is blockchain and then he explained it and from there he developed problems and so on I'm actually going to start my technical story with a different question why block blockchain and if actually if you ask that question, you end up having a totally different uh, technical story. So I hope there's going to be some interesting um, um, controversy in the, um, in, the, um, in the panel later on. And so here's, this is what I believe why blockchain is useful or why these technologies are useful, but also why I believe that many of the things uh, that are happening now might be a little bit overkill and might be shooting over the top. Because if you really focus on the new thing that blockchain is giving you or the new promise, you can actually implement it in a different way. So well, my, my kind of hypothesis here is that blockchain is about creating proofs for digital transactions. And that's what I'm going to explain and I'm going to tell this story in exactly this way. So uh, proof and digital transactions, I think the, the reason why there is something here is because this is something that is happening in the real world. And whenever we take something that is very useful in the real world and implement it in the digital or virtual world, usually good things happen. And so the useful concepts um, that we have in the real world to do transactions or to create proofs of transactions are two concepts. The concept of a witness and the concept of a receipt. And these are kind of just transactions of the real world getting married, right? And that, of course, it's important. You, you need some proof for, married, for marriage and you have witnesses usually called best man, and you have some receipts uh, like, a, like a wedding ring. Buying a house is also something where you usually want to have proof. Uh, you paid a lot of money for it and you want to have proof that you bought the house. Uh, or drinking alcohol. My, my son is actually now in, um, in Boston. He's 20 years old, which is very unfortunate for him because he cannot do anything when he's 20 years old because you have to prove that you're 21 years old. So what is it, why do we need proof in the real world uh, for transactions? You need proof because uh, you need either proof from previous transactions to, so that you can fulfill the transaction. So if I buy a house, I want to know that the person I buy the house from is the legitimate owner of the house. If I, go, if I get married, I want to make sure that my wife um, isn't already married, right? And that's why there's always this question, um, is anybody against it, right? Because, and, and, uh, and, and that's why you need witnesses uh, who would say, well, I, w I witnessed this, uh, your wife already got married to this um, other really great person, right? 
So one thing is to make sure that the conditions are met. But also, of course, with transactions come rights. Right? With the marriage, uh, actually my wife doesn't believe that I have any rights, but uh, uh, you, could, you could think of, yes, now we get married, you, you might be nice to me, right? Or there come accountabilities. Yeah? So this is what the real world does, and it has invented these concepts of witnesses and receipts. And essentially, this is going to be the gist of my talk, kind of how do we implement those, and that's where blockchain kind of plays a role. So let's go to the digital world. And uh, um, it turns out that witnesses and receipts, yeah, you uh, have been implemented, but actually they were not, didn't play such a huge role until recently. And the reason for that is, is that you really didn't need witnesses in the, let's, I'm from Microsoft, and in the good old days of Microsoft, which is called the PC era, you really didn't need witnesses. Because essentially you were on your own with your PC, right? And if you're alone with your PC, you generate the data, you own the data, and typically you trust yourself, right? You, you have your own stamp collection. You know what you're doing. You don't need to have proof that this is the, the, the uh, legit uh, stamp. But uh, that was the PC era. But now we are living in a world where data comes from all over the place. And again, I'm from Microsoft. We live in the cloud era. And the cloud is really about facilitating, co uh, facilitating collaboration. And uh, I have a... A very simple example, actually Mike uh, Stonebreak already knows that example, but uh, sorry about that for boring you here. And uh, this is just like an Excel spreadsheet um, that I cooked up. And, um, and uh, I just want to uh, just want to highlight something here about the age. So let's say you're Britney Spears and you're looking at this uh, spreadsheet and you want to know who you want to date tonight. Um, <laughs> and. Um, and so actually two of these ages um, were generated from Bing. Um, Bing has a, has a very nice feature. You can ask how old is Tom Cruise. You can ask what Britney Spears is, and you can actually integrate that very nicely into Excel. Yeah, and one of these is from wishful thinking. And, um, and, uh, and Britney Spears might want to know where do these things come from? Where do these ages come from? If it's Bing, yeah, it's okay. Bing can lie too and uh, gets things wrong. And uh, um, if this comes from me, she would want to know that. But let's get a little bit uh, more concrete example um, where actually these two things meet. So there's this fair trade and people who buy fair trade coffee usually pay a premium for it. Um, and so how does it work? Kind of, there are people here on the left side with a lot of love. They grow their, their coffee beans and, uh, and then there's an auditor that puts a, a trademark, uh, the trade, the fair trade on it. And then the coffee goes through many, many hands until it ends up in your, in your supermarket where you will pay a premium with a, I don't know whether you can see that there's actually on this, uh, on this bag of beans, there's this fair trade thing. And what can happen? Of course, um, malicious people like me will say, well, I'll just do a photocopy of this fair trade uh, uh, seal, and, um, and I can do that, and I will take this mass coffee here, and I will pay it, uh, and I will uh, sell it to the same premium. And this is, again, if, uh, if I'm a supermarket and I sell something to you, or in, throughout the supply chain, I want to create a proof um, for saying, uh, for, for verifying, or so that I can prove that this is really coffee that was grown with love, right? Uh, as opposed to coffee that was not grown with love. And so we want to kind of prove the green path, and we want to kind of be able, and kind of that's the other thing, or we want to verify the green path, we want to be able to detect the red path that is uh, kind of not great. Okay, so I, I, I don't have as nice beautiful pictures as Silvio had this morning, but I do have a an devil and, a, and an angel here. So what is the dream? Um, the dream is essentially that we want to create these proofs, and since this is in the digital world, we want to automate that. And essentially what we want to create is kind of a, a chain of, of, of trust. We want to kind of follow data or transactions, actions from the very beginning. Right? For when I buy a house, I want to follow this house from the moment it was built and then sold over time. 
when I marry a woman, I want to kind of have the trace from, I don't want to know about all her lovers, but I want to know about all her, uh, all her weddings and marriages, right? And this is kind of the trace that we want to create. And on the way, whenever something happens, we want to have witnesses or receipts, and those are the kind of the, the concepts that we will be working with. And uh, what I will argue here is that blockchain is a very nice idea, and I will repeat some things because I need to create some uh, my own terminology and my own examples here. Blockchain is a nice piece of technology, very interesting. I love the technology in many ways as a scientist, but really to kind of create this value proposition that we're here, it's first of all, it's a little bit too much, which is actually causing a lot of problems. Um, and Silvio mentioned many of those problems where it was too much. And it's actually not enough in many other ways. And so that's why I'm suggesting here kind of a little bit of a different way to think and, uh, and work with blockchains. So what am I going to do? I'm going to do this blockchain one-on-one -on -one again, just that we have the same understanding. And then I'm going to show you a kind of, I'm going to use a metaphor, essentially how does the real world uh, create proofs or receipts. It actually uses digital or cash registers where you do something, type something in and then it creates a receipt. And essentially I want to create something like that in the digital world. And of course I want this building block to work um, in a shoe store, in, uh, um, in a city hall and, uh, and in a church when you get married. And then um, if we do have time, uh, maybe go a little bit on how this will express itself uh, in, in practice. So essentially the two concepts that I will be kind of, and high level, this is, it's going to be somewhat technical but high level, the two concepts we care about is witnesses and the other concept is this what um, Silvio called this morning tamper-proof, that you create something that is tamper-proof, and these two in blockchain are intertwined. And what I will be arguing for is that maybe you can decouple them and do better. So I'll just give this uh, very small example, and because I, I've spent a lot of time in doing this animation, so I'll show you this. Um, so this is kind of a blockchain. Actually, Amy is the chief financial officer of Microsoft, and Harry is my boss. Um, he's, the, he's the real head of... Uh, uh, I'm not the head of, uh, uh, of Microsoft Research. I'm only the head of Microsoft Research Redmond, which is much smaller. But Harry is actually the big guy, and uh, so I'm actually interested in Harry stealing and getting a lot of money because that's good for me as well. But here, uh, let's look at this from the perspective of Amy. So let's just have this blockchain or this kind of... Um, ledger or whatever you want to call it. At the beginning, Amy has $70 and Harry has $50. Then Amy gives Harry $20 of budget. And then because Harry did such a great job or his uh, research org did such a great job, gives him another $30. And of course, if you have this, and this could live in the cloud um, and could, or could live anywhere in this case, this is not really protected. So Harry would be kind of tempted to change this 20 and turn it into a 50. Yeah, because he's greedy and, um, and he has greedy uh, lab directors who, uh, who want to have budget even more. So at this point, um, um, there's no way for Amy to prove that uh, actually Amy only wanted to give him 20 and there's, uh, we're actually stuck. And that's where blockchain comes in and where these two ideas come in and I'm gonna play with them and that's why I'm gonna show you that. So what does blockchain do? Blockchain does do two things. Um, the first thing is it kind of uh, takes a snapshot of every new thing that you do from the old thing. So that's how it creates a chain. So look at this HB1 is kind of like a picture um, that you do with your, with your mobile phone. Well, technically it's a hash of the first block and the HB2 is a picture of the second block. And then, and that is the important thing, is it has these witnesses. So this, these pictures are kind of the chain that create the, the tamper-proofness and these witnesses are important for, because they keep uh, also these pictures. And so if now um, uh, Harry wants to kind of steal $30 from Amy, what essentially happens is that this HB2 picture doesn't match um, the, the first picture anymore. 
And uh, of course, Harry is, might be smarter. He's actually an image processing person. So he might actually play around with this picture on HB2 as well, uh, on block three. But in this case, the pictures with, that the witnesses have don't match anymore. And then everybody can see that this data is, is, uh, is fraudulent, uh, has been tampered with, right? And those are the, essentially the ideas that I care about. And of course, Silvio had a lot of other things on how do the witnesses uh, um, um, agree on what their picture is and how do you determine to add a thing in that. And actually, I will argue for, some, uh, for a very different solution to what, uh, what Silvio did. So this is blockchain. And now let's look at the existing IT world and how it works compared to blockchain. And that's kind of my, my big statement here. So in the existing world, you would implement this exactly same thing using a database system. I'm a database person, and how does it work? Essentially, when you, you look at your bank, when you transfer money, you take some money from one account, so you read, so let's say, um, um, whoever, Andreas wants to give me uh, $30, I look at Andreas' bank account, I take subtract $30, uh, I look at Donald's bank account, I add $30, that's what it does. Read and write. This is a very old technology. So what does the blockchain do? Yeah? The blockchain does it, does, it allows reads, you can read to it, but you can actually don't, cannot write to it because then you are tampering with the pictures and you're getting around with all this, so you can only append. And that's actually a very substantial difference. Yeah? Um, if you're used to reading and writing, and now you cannot write anymore, this is bad. You essentially need to re rebuild your application. But of course, it has this other great thing, and that is this verify operation. I can actually give a proof. I can, if I'm kind of Amy, I can, I can ask Satya and, uh, and, um, and, and Terry, who are in the board of Microsoft, hey, is this, uh, does this match? And they will say, no, it doesn't match. And the only way to make it matching is to recreate the real truth um, uh, application, so uh, the real data, so Amy can prove that she really only gave $20 to Harry. So essentially what we have, and that's kind of what the, the right side of this slide says, we have these traditional IT systems, and Sylvia was kind of talking a lot this morning about performance, security, but there's actually much, much more. There's standardization, there's tooling, there is, um, um, uh, there's, uh, there's availability, there's a huge amount of work that has been going in these traditional systems. So when, when uh, Silvio this morning asked, well, the big question is how to add a block to this, my answer is this question has been answered 40 years ago. Database systems for 40 years have done exactly that. They've been adding transactions to a log, right? This is what, uh, and, and I hope uh, Mike can confirm that, that that problem is solved. Why do we have to pro solve it again? I don't want to solve it again. So what I really want to do, and, and then there's all these other things like standardization, um, Blockchains, like, okay, there's a, um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Mohan will talk about Hyperledger. This morning, um, you, you heard about Algorand. Um, there's much more, Ethereum, there's Corda, and so on. There's no standardization, and you have to, if you use blockchain today, you have to make a bet, right? Okay, I'm, I, I like Mohan, I'm going to use Hyperledger. Okay, he's a nice guy. But actually, yeah, maybe IBM decides, well, maybe Hyperledger was not the great thing. There's a new great thing. Algorand is the new big thing. I have to rewrite everything. There's no protection and so on. So what is it that we really want to achieve? And this is the perspective I want to give. Essentially, what you want to do is keep what is good there. The way we do transactions, it's all solved, it's all good. And yes, there is value because we collaborate and we, don't, uh, we want to do things and we want to go to court afterwards. Yes, I really bought this house, I paid you for this, um, I didn't have this ice cream um, and so on. Um, you want to have that, but don't, inter don't reinvent everything or don't, uh, I don't know what the English saying is, don't uh, throw out the child with the, the baby with the bath. Yeah, don't do that, right? 
Keep the, keep the bath, and just if you add trust, put a smile on the baby, right? And this is exactly what uh, we want to do, and I'll show you a little bit how this works. So the abstraction that we are creating is called a digital register, but the idea is really very simple. And uh, so we haven't talked much about receipts yet, but this, is, this component actually now becomes very uh, relevant and important. So essentially what we will do is what we do in real life when we buy shoes, when we go to the movie cinemas and so on. Essentially what we do is we do, I buy a movie ticket, I get a receipt from it, from a very standard component that takes my money and creates a receipt. And then later on, if I need to, I show this receipt to enter the movie theater and um, I get in and that's when I need to verify or need to audit this. And the idea is really to separate these two things rather than keep them together. In the blockchain one-on-one -on -one that I showed you, and that's why I was so careful in doing that, they are together, they're intertwined. Unless kind of the board agrees on the last picture of the block and has consensus, the, the whole system doesn't work. Here, we want to decouple the two things and we want to allow the kind of board, we want to allow Satya to kind of verify today and Terry like in three months um, and, and still things should, should match and, and verify. So how does this work? So essentially, we, Amy is working with a normal database system. She will do reads and writes, and, but the database system is a little bit kind of um, enhanced. Um, and actually, you don't trust the database system, and you don't have to even trust this, uh, this digital register there. This can all be untrusted. It's all in the cloud, all in, in an area where every hacker can mess around with this stuff. So what the database system does is it does create, and it does actually do that today, it's something like a blockchain or like an audit log, as you want to call it. And of course, it will uh, do that and it will add some crypto to it. Um, and I'll get to that uh, at a high level. Um, um, that, that makes sure that it kind of reflects what it has seen. But what it also does, it returns a receipt to Amy saying, this is what you did. And it's kind of like a picture, it's a, it's a hash. And now Amy can actually test and can verify the log herself, or she can delegate that to somebody else, or, or the, the board will say, I want to actually verify that everything happens. So Satya and Terry can do that, they can verify the log. And so now different things can happen, and I'm just going to animate that through. If, if Harry changes uh, the 50, um, the 20 to a 50 in the log, then essentially Satya and Terry will see that their pictures and the receipt assembled with the pictures will actually not, ma uh, not match anymore. And the other thing that can happen is Harry can change the database uh, with the 100. And if that happens, actually will also be caught, even though um, um, Satya and Terry don't verify it, but what they do verify is all the receipts. And so the 100, we will actually give a receipt for the 100. And, uh, and Amy will kind of collect, just like a, like a tax advisor, will collect all her receipts in her little uh, kind of, uh, we used to say, butter. Uh, butter box, right, where you collect all your receipts, you give it to your tax advisor, and then as a bulk, they are, they are validated, and then, of course, again, this uh, verification will fail. Now, the, the, um, the technology to do that is actually very old, um, but you have to kind of reuse it in a creative way. Um, it's actually from another Turing Award winner, I, I guess, who's not here today, uh, Manuel Blum, and he wrote, uh, if you don't know, if you haven't read that paper from 1994, it's just a fabulous paper. It's just an amazing paper, uh, and it's about verified memory. It solves a different problem, but it actually can be used here to do this decoupling, to do all the crypto right, and it has a very nice algorithm. And then what we did at Microsoft Research is, yeah, um, kind of from the genius ideas, uh, the 1% the genius, we added the 99% sweat to that 1% genius of uh, Manuel Blum to make it really work. Okay, so I'll just show you a little bit in, in practice why this works. It's probably not the best to implement Bitcoin, but we've gone through a number of, I have like two more minutes, right? And I'll, I'll, I'll keep that. We went through a number of applications that I'll just go through. For most of the applications, actually, I didn't even use the word decentralized here. Yeah? Why didn't I use it? Because 
it's not needed for most applications. Silvio said, oh, my scheme is truly decentralized. Well, I say, good for you, but we don't need it. And uh, so I'll, I'll, just, uh, I'll just explain some of these applications. So the classic, I'll, I'll just go through that very quickly, is uh, buying houses where you really need to have this chain that I bought the house from a legit owner to prove that this owner was a legit owner, that he or she bought it from a legit owner, and so on, until the, uh, what uh, Silvio called the genesis block that, uh, um, that captures when the house existed or kind of at the uh, Big Bang when, when the Earth was created and nobody owned anything. <laughs> so this is how you would implement this in a blockchain, and this is how you would essentially implement this in this world um, where everybody kind of shares or works together in a, in a database, and there's, I have more to say about it. It doesn't have to be a central database. And you create these logs, these ledgers, which are part of it. And you can actually add, and this is one of the beauty of these things, as you want, you can add auditors or the auditors of your choice. And one interesting thing that maybe Mohan will also go in a little bit more detail in is um, what is if you have confidentiality? What is if you, um, if Alice and the doesn't, if Alice sells her house to Bob, but both don't really want Cecily to see about it. And actually there are solutions for that as well. Um, at Microsoft we've created a, a system called Coco, but there are other uh, ideas and uh, ways to do that. So with that, I kind of, uh, I think I'm done with time. I'm going to skip all the other examples. I think this kind of technology or this basic technology is here to stay because it does something useful. It takes a, a useful concept from reality, from the real world that we got used to, witnesses and uh, receipts, and formalizes it in the digital world. So that's here to stay and uh, we want to uh, keep that. But we have to rethink completely rather than kind of what I believe Silvio did is build a new system, see that it sucks, and then kind of improve that system. I think we need to rethink on how to integrate these concepts into our existing IT infrastructures rather than reinventing the wheel. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Simo Hand from uh, IBM Research in Alberton. Uh, we also have known each other for a couple of years, like four years or so. Um, yeah, thank you. So it goes a long way back. Um, he's also a database person uh, from his origin and still interested in that kind of technology. Um, he was made an IBM fellow many, many years ago, uh, had a stint in India uh, as the chief scientist of IBM research in India, but now is back uh, in California. Uh, and uh, he will talk, yes, yes, you can talk in a minute. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I was not rushing you. About, uh, <laughs> blockchain from the perspective of uh, public versus private blockchains and mm -hmm. advantages, disadvantages in that respect. Mohan. Thank you, Andreas. It um, gives me great pleasure to be here. Last year also I was here, but that was in one of the workshops that I did a half an hour presentation. I don't know if any of you, attend well, Leslie was there. As far as I know, he was the only one amongst the laureates who showed up for that one. Um, so this presentation is actually going to be talking about the stuff that uh, Silvio didn't talk about at all. He had this private chain in, in this one of the last uh, few slides. He didn't even utter that phrase. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what I consider to be the really practical stuff that will make a big difference as opposed to all the hype with uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So, uh, that uh, you, I'm sure you've been hearing about a lot all over the place in popular press, everywhere you have lots of discussions about this and speculation up the wazoo. And if you are into um, gambling, feel free to indulge in all this stuff. Otherwise, I would advise you to stay away from all the uh, cryptocurrency business. Um, if you do get interested in following up more on the stuff, there's that URL where you'll find lots of... Uh, presentations and links to videos and such things, since I have only half an hour to speak here. So uh, if you were to, if I had all the time in the world, <laughs> that's a kind of topics I'll cover. I wanted this presentation to be accessible to even non-techie people, and even amongst techie people, people who haven't heard anything about uh, uh, Bitcoin or any of that stuff. But 
today, as you will see, the numbers will be skipping a whole bunch of slides. So if you go to the full-blown presentation, you'll see the hidden slides over there. Um, so I'll concentrate, like Donald said, more on the Hyperledger fabric, about which I know a great deal. It's not just an IBM system. It's actually done in a community way under the auspices of the Hyperledger Consortium, which is run under the uh, governance structure of uh, the Linux Foundation. So IBM initiated it by contributing source code to a system that was developed within the company, and that was about two years ago. And since then, it's been developed in a community way. It's all open source and such. Um, there isn't enough time to talk about the different kinds of applications, but um, if you are interested, we can talk about it outside as well as uh, during the panel. There is a separate uh, panel, of course, on um, uh, applications. Um, in terms of performance, uh, it sucks big time, the Bitcoin way of doing business, seven transactions per second, 10 minutes or even more per transaction in terms of response time. This is all like mind-bogglingly inefficient compared to 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when Andreas and I and various people, Jim Gray and so on, used to talk about uh, you know 1K transactions per second at the peak of uh, this kind of thing, which resulted in the TPC benchmark and such coming up. Uh, but even beyond that, this notion of transaction fee and such, this all is a, an artifact of the way this whole Bitcoin thing has been developed. But if you go to a private blockchain environment, all this is uh, unnecessary in many ways because traditionally business processes have involved multiple organizations, and there isn't any notion of some random guys outside of the system becoming a party to it and doing this validation and proof of work and all that. So the way the private blockchains work compared to the public ones, you don't let any random person who doesn't reveal his or her identity to become party to the network. You only admit people who have a business reason to be part of the network because there's a business process or a workflow that involves these different people. And so when you think that way, then all this, uh, you know, um, bending over backwards to account for Byzantine behavior and all that is much less of a problem. Just like when you are, you know, trying to use Uber or Airbnb and such, you know a bit about the people involved, but the companies that are behind it know a lot more about the people. And as a result, you know, you don't have to screw up your mainline performance and such just because there is that slim possibility somebody might be doing bad things and such. So uh, the analogy I give is when you go on the road, just because there is the possibility that you might get hit and such by a car or pedestrian or whatever, cyclist, you don't put armor plating around yourself all the time and walk around. So in that sense, I think this whole idea of anonymity or pseudo-anonymity and all that, that's been the basis, if you like, or the fundamental characteristic of uh, Bitcoin and even Ethereum, which is a follow-on to Bitcoin, has completely warped the thinking of uh, too many people in this world, both academic types as well as industry types. I come from Silicon Valley. I know all the hoopla that's there with respect to all these cryptocurrencies and such, where almost everybody, without even mentioning it, only discusses open blockchain. And they think this, all this other stuff is, you know, who cares or whatever. So they give... If at all they mention it, only lip service to these private blockchains, and then they will say things like, oh, it's not completely decentralized. Like Donald said, who cares? I mean, if the people that are involved in the business process are happy with what's going on, why should I now make it completely decentralized and let uh, the associated scalability issues and all that come in? Um, anyway, so I won't spend too much time on this, but so, uh, so my point is I'm going to be focused on private blockchain. What are these things? These are the ones where only the people who have a reason to be there, who are then granted uh, certificates and such, and as a result, you know who they are and so on. So if they do misbehave, you can sooner than later, you know, take care of them by booting them out of the network or reporting to the authorities and so on. So in this whole anonymous way of doing business, that's the other problem. If somebody steals your money, you don't know who to go to complain because all you have is the address of this wallet that represented your money. And so nobody is supposed to be aware of who you are, really, except for the people who 
try to send money to you, and hence they need to know the address of the real life person to whom they want to send the money. But if you just look at the blockchain data structure itself, that's representing all the gazillion transactions that went on, you have no clue who did what with whom and in the real world sense as to what happened. And of course, there are all these algorithms now where people are trying to second guess as to who the real world entities are. And of course, the CIA and all these agencies want to know if there is a lot of illegal things being done under the garb of all this uh, anonymity, then they want to, for various reasons, uh, nail these people and such. So from that perspective also, I'm not very happy about the overemphasis on anonymity and the consequent illegal things that have been done with open blockchains. So um, there's lots of activity. Uh, like um, uh, Donald said, there is chaos right now in terms of non-existence of standards. There are many systems that are under development, some of which are ready for prime time usage, and hence there are production deployments that have been done starting from early last year. The first one that I am aware of happened in February last year with the 0.6 release of the fabric. And um, so in terms of the fabric specifically, uh, even Oracle has decided they're going to uh, come out with, and I believe they did come out with in the last week or two, uh, Oracle as a uh, blockchain as a service offering on the Oracle Cloud. IBM has had it for more than a year. It's called the IBM Blockchain Platform. And there are also lots of Chinese vendors who are behind now the um, uh, fabric way of doing business. But there are competing things like uh, Hyperledger Sawtooth, which Intel initiated. And then, of course, uh, like he said, uh, there is Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, there is R3 Corda, and on and on and on. And they also have in Microsoft something called the Cocoa Framework. Um, so at least, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course, because they are a cloud provider, just like Amazon and so on, they run many of these different competing systems, if you like, uh, while they themselves might also be working on their own thing, like one of which uh, uh, Donald talked about. But in general, I would say you better be careful. Like he said, you will have this problem if you choose to bet on some system which a year from now or whatever is a losing system and hence now you are the monkey on your back either to rewrite your app to run on a different system or if the system you bet on happens to be an open source one you then have to take on the job of maintaining it enhancing it fixing bugs and so on and not everybody can do those sorts of things so but there is also uh, there are many efforts underway now in terms of trying to do uh, benchmarks for blockchain systems. So the way I characterize for the database folks in the audience, the blockchain technology is now at a state where 40 years ago when Mike and my buddies at IBM Research had done uh, you know, Ingress and System R and DB2 and such came out, where there's lots of functionality in these systems but you are on your own with respect to figuring out when to use what feature and for what kind of use case, uh, what you should be doing and so on. Similar in flavor to you know, not having index advisor, partitioning advisor and this and that in the good old days when these systems, relational systems came out. The one sad thing now compared to then is that even though Mike and company came up with Quell and my buddies at IBM came out with uh, SQL, at least the underlying conceptual model for relational systems was what my other buddy, Ted Cord, had come up with, which was the relational model. Whereas in these systems, what you'll discover is that not only are the APIs different, but even the underlying conceptual models are different between these systems. Some of the systems like R3 Corda, for example, focused exclusively almost on um, financial industry use cases. So they have some other, some higher level notions that relate to that industry embedded as part of their uh, conceptual model, whereas systems like Fabric uh, are more general purpose. And so you have to implement things like cryptocurrency if you so want to do on top of the system. It's not coming with its own currency and things like that, like Ethereum, for example, has Ether, and uh, they also have this notion of gas for charging and such. So. Um, in terms of uh, the hoopla that's going on with ICOs and all that, I don't want to waste too much time. I think it's all a lot of bogus stuff, meaning attempts to circumvent the regulations to make money off of uh, ordinary citizens and such, which is like uh, a different way of doing IPOs, but with a lot less 
regulatory uh, constraints of the SEC and such. And so there was enough chaos that the governments decided to in intervene. And even within the US government, there isn't agreement on how to treat uh, you know, these ICOs. For instance, the SEC has declared that um, except for um, Bitcoin and Ether, the rest of them will be treated as security. The Commodities and Future Trading Commission wants to treat crypto assets as commodity, just like wheat and other kinds of uh, commodities. And then the Financial Enforcement Network wants to treat it like money. So there is all this going on in the midst of which, as a result of which the ICOs, the initial coin offerings, uh, started tanking. Yeah? What is ICO? Initial coin offering, which is like shares that the IPOs result uh, uh, in coming out with, which are then uh, traded in the regular markets and so on. Whereas here, you can think of it as money or tokens that are created by people who want to raise money through the uh, uh, crowdsourcing kind of way, if you like, except that all they do is come up with some white paper, some mumbo jumbo they say in their uh, slideware, and they thought they could get away with it, and for a while they got away with it. Once the SEC came out with its declaration, they started sending show cost notices to all these people who had raised money through those means. And it also happens that a lot of these kinds of um, uh, ways of raising money, after a while, these tokens became worthless, because quite a lot of them were uh, fly-by-night operators who were ripping off the public and things like that. So. Um, in terms of um, the view of uh, Nobel laureate of uh, economics, who many of you probably read uh, uh, you know, his articles in the New York Times and so on, Paul Kruger has said that uh, this whole cryptocurrency business has set the world behind by 300 years. There was already you know, little kingdoms and principalities and all that that had their own currencies and chaos was there. There was a good reason why the concept of money evolved over time to have the notion of uh, um, fiat currencies and such, but if you listen to the 20-somethings and the other people who are trying to make a fast buck, they'll all, you know, say all these uh, completely decentralized apps, I'm going to solve the world hunger problem through this whole new way of doing business, you know, libertarian kinds of thoughts and on and on and on. Um, I don't want to waste too much time, so let's go on with the real stuff. So if you look at uh, the blockchain area in general, to some extent uh, Donald talked about this, it brings together many ideas from both distributed systems and database systems. I can spend many hours discussing what aspects of these things are uh, having a significant role. In particular, in the database system arena, we know how to do, and that was my first project, distributed databases and replication and all this kind of stuff. It's like almost 40 years old kind of technologies, right? But if you look at um, uh, distributed systems, as I've said multiple times, workflow management systems and business process systems have been around for a long time. So what are we trying to do here? We want to now, in a context like this, a use case scenario, import-export scenario, there are many organizations that are involved going from one country to another, something being shipped. Uh, the guy who picks up the package, delivers it to the airport or the port, seaport and then the transportation company that actually takes it to the other country, authorities like customs and so on and so on. They all might be using computers and database systems, but they're all independently done things. The programs that operate on these assets that are being transferred around, whatever the goods are that are being exported and imported and such. And they might even exchange EDI kinds of messages, but there isn't an overall nice framework under which the rules of engagement are clearly spelled out and so on. The smart contract that he talked about is an attempt to now bring more rigor to this chaotic way in which things have gone on, where even today there are still a lot of paper documents. They might actually scan them and put them in the system, but that doesn't mean they are digitally processed, digitally understood. And this leads to a lot of inefficiency, Attempts to, if something goes wrong, somebody dies because the food got spoiled during transport, uh, they'll go try to modify the temperature in the truck and this and that recording to claim that their truck was not the problem and so on. And those are hard to detect as uh, Donald was uh, talking about before. So this is a pretty chaotic way of doing things. There's no single source of truth and such. 
the, the blockchain way of doing it is to do this with still the same set of players, but in a way where the provenance and who did what, when, and uh, the recording of that information in a way where people after the fact cannot claim that they didn't agree to something being done is what the big deal is. This is not the way you'll hear these uh, you know, open blockchain people talking about as if the only thing that matters is you know, Mohan wants to send Donald $50, does he have at least $50 at that point? This is the dumbest, simplest kind of thing that they all get hung up on. In the real world, for the real kinds of processes and transactions that go on, there's a lot more stuff that you need to worry about. So random people cannot just be brought into the picture to verify whether this transaction makes sense or not. I mean, if Donald wants to marry somebody, uh, who is this third person other than the priest who is actually questioning the two of them that gets to decide whether this is a valid uh, marriage or not and such. So uh, still, I mean, the witness and all that that he talked about has makes sense, but purely random people passing judgment and creating this block of transactions and so on is not really, in my opinion, a meaningful thing. So what does this um, blockchain as a service offering have? It has the fabric running on the IBM cloud, and on top of it, IBM contributed yet another project to the Hyperledger Consortium called the Composer, which is like for database people, 4GL tools that ease the burden of developing SQL applications for database systems. You don't have to use it, but if you use it, it makes it easier for you to generate applications, use case scenarios that can then be deployed on the fabric. One point that has not been made, as far as I can recall today, is this distinction between digital assets, purely digital assets being managed in a blockchain versus digital representations of physical assets being managed. The difficulty there is, if it's a purely digital asset like uh, music recording or video and such, it's easy to tell with all this hashing and such whether what you got is the original thing or somebody mucked around with it. But when you have physical things like a diamond and then you have some representation of that diamond in the, in the digital system, how do you tell that along the uh, uh, supply chain or whatever, um, somebody didn't substitute the real diamond with a fake one? So this is where this notion of crypto anchor verifier has been proposed where uh, essentially this particular technology is attaching a, a lens to a cell phone camera which is able to take pictures and various kinds of measure measurements at the microscopic level. And so you can do things like, in the case of diamonds, the inside of the diamond has a signature, which is like a human fingerprint. But in the case of cotton and high-end olive oil and such, you can look at things like viscosity and spectral value or even uh, QR codes. What appears to be a continuous line to the naked eye or when you use a photocopier is actually discontinuous line and things like that. No different from currencies and such for which governments and printing um, uh, entities have developed various ways of making it almost impossible to uh, uh, produce fake currency. Uh, so it's these sorts of things that, yeah. Are you assuming private blockchain here or Private. Yeah. So the guy who produces the original goods, he puts the hash of whatever the signature, quote unquote, of the anchor, crypto anchor is. So this is for a private blockchain of, say, size 10? No. It can be much bigger, but we can have a lengthier conversation about the scalability and all that. But to begin with, at least, this is a much smaller set of people than the thousands and all that that Silvio, forget even what Silvio said. There are other systems that are out there which don't even have any clue at any given time how many players are there because they willy-nilly come and go. There's no central registry, nothing. Even in his case, I don't know exactly how he knows that at any given time, 1,000 people will be around and 10% of them will participate in doing whatever decision making. He didn't talk about any of that, right? What is the incentive for, or, you know, why should there be anybody at all at any given time that are bothering to take part in whatever his algorithm is doing. So there are many things like that that need to be worried about. So with respect to the tampering that somebody brought up, um, uh, questioning uh, Donald, there are things like Intel's SGX and IBM on its mainframe as even much fancier thing, which are these uh, 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 secure ways of doing computations and so on, where even the operators of the system cannot 
muck around with the code that's running or even listen in on the data exchanges, reads and writes that are being performed. Um, and this is super duper compared to SGX because SGX has a lot of limitations on how much memory and disk storage can be brought under the umbrella of that secure execution. So we take advantage of this also to provide higher, level, uh, uh, higher levels of security and such. There are various concepts here. I don't have the time to discuss everything in detail. Essentially, the different organizations are represented as peers in this network. And then you have users who are people within such organizations. Just like in database systems, they have different privileges. Somebody can execute this transaction, but not that transaction, and so on. These are blockchain transactions we are talking about. So the general idea is that I have to correct one thing that Donald said. This whole idea of immutability, people misrepresent it all the time. It's only in the blockchain data structure that it's append only. In the state database, where you are actually tracking and manipulating the states of these different assets, whether it's diamonds, packages, whatever, food ingredients, it's very much an in-place update kind of database. You can do updates, deletes, the whole works. Just like in a traditional database system, the recovery log is append only. Here, the blockchain data structure, which is outside the database system, is append only. And the contents vary somewhat. Uh, I've spent my entire life working on recovery, right? So uh, in the case of the blockchain, they not only have the modified data-related information, but they also have even what was read and things like that, the so-called read set and uh, write set get recorded there. They, you don't typically intersperse multiple, with multiple transactions log records with one another. You describe one transaction in its entirety and then the next transaction and so on. So in some such ways, it, they are different. But in, in effect, you know, you have things like smart contracts. You have the, um, the, the, the state database where you are doing these in-place updates. So this whole notion of, uh, you know, the thing becoming longer and longer that uh, Brooks brought up, uh, that is like Donald said, in the case of traditional database systems, the recovery log you can archive it to slow medium, and then you know you almost never access it after a certain point. Or you can even truncate it if you have done enough backups and such. But the state database doesn't have to be growing at all, because you, you could delete these assets, and then they disappear, and the space is freed up. So in that sense, they are no different from traditional uh, database systems. But the problem with this truncation business is that today, at least, in almost all of these systems, when a new node is brought into the picture, even in a private blockchain, the way the new node's state database gets initialized is not the traditional database way, where you would go to one of the other guys and ask for the copy of the data. And then while that copy is getting communicated, any other transaction that's going on, you have to do catch up and all that. Because they don't want to trust necessarily the database contents, but they are trusting with all the hashing, the, the blockchain itself, they wind up grabbing the blockchain from one of the other guys. And then they start from time zero from the Genesis block which is not necessarily when the universe came into existence, but when this particular blockchain network came into existence. And then they go through all the transactions. And that's where the problem comes with at least today's way of doing business, having to maintain forever, as long as the network is continuing to exist, what happened from the time that network came into existence. Uh, just like in database system, you have you know, system programmer, DBA, this, that. There are new roles that have been defined in this case which have to do with who comes up with the, uh, the contract itself, uh, the rules of engagement, who codes it up, and then who are the people who get to design the, the elements of the architecture. What are the elements of the architecture? So if you look at what the composer lets you do, you get to define who the, um, what the assets are that you're going to manage. So there's an asset registry who the participants are, what organizations and people within such organizations. Uh, different organizations have different roles to play, importer, exporter, trucking company, whatever. And then you have the transactions themselves. This diamond got mined, and then it got polished, and then it got split into smaller diamonds, and then it got uh, sold in wholesale, retail, blah, 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 and then somebody bought a single diamond, put it on a ring, and proposed to somebody. These are the various transactions and state transitions on these um, assets that are being tracked in this database system. There are any number of applications that are uh, being worked on, some of which are in production deployment. There's a book, if you're interested, that talks about lots of use cases. The idea 
that so and not idea the, the 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 statement that's made in that book is that the blockchain technology in its full-blown uh, implemented version and so on has the potential to be like the second coming of the internet in the sense of how the internet with all the browser and all that coming up made a big difference for the guy on the street not you and i as geeky people in a similar sense with respect to real world not all the speculative stuff that i have been dissing in a real world sense day-to-day -day transactions and so on can benefit a lot more from all the rigorous way in which the blockchain way of doing business uh, uh, will let you have. But at the same time, I have to say, just like it happens with NoSQL, MapReduce, this, that, there are any number of people who are trying to use, misuse blockchains for applications for which they are not appropriate, either from the fact that, because of the fact that there aren't multiple organizations involved, or because the performance requirements are such, like in NASDAQ and uh, SEC and so and in uh, uh, NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange and such. So um, I will quickly flip through. I'll just show a couple of slides that are important to communicate exactly how in the fabric transactions get executed. So bear with me for a minute. So this just shows you when a transaction is initiated, it causes just like a stored procedure being invoked on the database server side, the smart contract being invoked which then potentially could invoke other smart contracts and all that, during the course of which there'll be database accesses made. So in that sense, they are pretty much like database applications. And the databases are accessed, uh, the state database locally is accessed in order to read and modify the assets that are being manipulated using that particular blockchain transaction, diamond, whatever. And the way it's been done in the fabric at this point the first stage of execution in a three-staged execution is a mere simulation of the execution of the transaction. And that's because multiple parties are asked to endorse this transaction, get their agreement before they proceed forward. This is like the priest asking the groom and the bride and so on. Uh, and, and the result of that simulation is that it's like optimistic concurrency control. The reads and the writes that would like to be performed are determined and then the uh, stuff is sent to the client who then checks whether these different uh, endorsing peers are in agreement. If they are, then it sends it to the next stage where there is this ordering service which creates a block of many such transactions, which then sends it out to everybody now, including non-endorsing peers, and no, endorsing peers who didn't get involved, who then, like in optimistic concurrency control, do validation to see whether the items that were read during simulation are still in the same state, in which case, it's considered a valid, uh, um, it's considered a successful validation, and then the right set is taken and dumped into the database. So the smart contract is not executed in stage three. It's done only in stage one. So this you know, requires that there be concerns about uh, non-determinism and all that, and I can delve with that in great length, whereas today, um, some systems are able to accommodate non-determinism. Systems like Ethereum demand that you don't have any kind of non-determinism in your smart contract. You can't look up where the moon is or invoke a RAND function and things like that. So um, there are more systems that one can talk about. The project I'm doing right now is to add relational database support because today the fabric only supports key value store and a document store as the state database. And there are many problems to be solved. So this area is ripe for all the students and faculty members and so on who are looking for a topics to work on. As I said, we are in the same state as relational was 40 years ago. Thank you. Thank you much. So the last presentation will be given by two speakers, not in parallel, but uh, sequentially. Um, the first one will be Roman Matsut, and the uh, second one, Martin Henze. Uh, they are both PhD students at the University of Aachen, the Technical University of Aachen, uh, at the Chair for uh, Communication and Distributed Systems. So they might as well have been uh, young researchers participating in the HLF, but now they are contributing to the hot topic anyway. Uh, both variations make sense. Their focus will be on uh, scalability issues and on uh, the fact that uh, one of the uh, most frequently touted properties of blockchains, immutability, uh, might actually cause some problems in certain situations. Um, 
which reminds me of a talk that I heard many years ago uh, from a friend of mine, Ted Helen. Uh, the title of the talk was Immutability Changes Everything. Um, so let's see if that's true for blockchain as well. Please. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm Roman, this is uh, Martin. And um, first of all, I have to apologize that we're not going to give such a visionary talk as the others did today. Uh, but nevertheless, we hope it might be a little bit interesting for you. It's not as visionary because we will strictly uh, stick to Bitcoin and um, weaknesses of, uh, of it, of which we have heard uh, some, quite some today. Um, but it might be nevertheless interesting because what we're going to talk about was not really covered up to now and might uh, in, uh, extrapolate to um, other cryptocurrencies. And furthermore, we're sticking to Bitcoin because um, yeah, it has its issues, but in some way it's, uh, it's the big old tank that's rolling through city uh, in a way that, yeah, it may be all not uh, state of the art anymore, but it still has impact. So what we're going to talk about is a content-centric perspective on, uh, on weaknesses of blockchain technology. So, um, as Andreas already said, immutability plays a central role in this because it's one of the crucial features that um, open public blockchains have. And um, to achieve this immutability, uh, it's important that uh, all nodes, um, in an ideal world, all nodes uh, store a full copy of the blockchain so they have a full uh, copy of all the transaction history. So this means we have um, our blockchain here and uh, the Bitcoin network in this case that is maintaining the blockchain in that every node stores a full copy. So this means when we have new transactions arriving, um, once they are mined into a block, they will be distributed to all the nodes. And um, while this has certainly issues like um, slow transaction throughput due to the proof of work and so forth, there's also other problems which we will uh, deal with in this talk. Namely, um, if everyone has a copy of this blockchain, what happens if we are able somehow to store illegal content onto the blockchain? What does happen to all the, uh, all the nodes on the Bitcoin network? Um, and as was also mentioned, scalability issues. So we will also be dealing, or Martin will be dealing in the second part of the talk with um, truncation, which we heard of already today, but in a sense that we can maybe extend um, the existing big old tank that is Bitcoin um, without doing uh, a hard fork or losing trust, hopefully. So in the first part of the talk, I will be um, detailing on uh, objectionable blockchain content. And to dive into this topic, we just uh, revisit the scenario that I briefly sketched on the first slide uh, and just exchange a little thing. So instead of um, uh, issuing legit transactions, we somehow are able to, to put objectionable content onto the blockchain and this is then redistributed um, to all the nodes because every full node has to store a full local copy, as we just, uh, just heard, that in order to bootstrap new nodes that are joining the system. So because the blockchain should be immutable in order to prevent double spending of coins, it means that deletion is possible at a certain block depth. So, if we don't detect it up front, we basically cannot delete such content anymore. And um, in order to make new, uh, new nodes still be able to synchronize with the current state of, this, of the network, um, those full nodes have to store this unwanted copy uh, content uh, indefinitely. So, and this potentially, so if we really have illegal content that makes its way into the blockchain, potentially also makes um, the phone notes liable for the content that they didn't even want it in the first place but are forced to, uh, to store nevertheless. So now I'm going to talk a bit about consequences this um, may, may have. So first of all, it's um, the ba very basic ones are technical issues. So such content, if it uh, manages to make its way into the blockchain, is not wanted by the whole network because Bitcoin is intended to only st uh, store financial transactions who is sending Bitcoins to whom. So it unnecessarily in a way increases the blockchain size and uh, also it means that more transactions may be cached because technically um, Bitcoin clients usually cache transactions that may be spent in the future 
in order to, to increase performance and we basically pollute this cache with, um, with uh, transactions that just hold content and not describe any financial transaction. Also, there may be financial issues because in doing so, because we have to, um, as I show uh, on the next slide, we have to manipulate transactions. This means that they are not accessible anymore, the bitcoins that are sent to these uh, fake addresses, as I will show soon. So um, we have to burn currency. And also, if uh, users are aware that I might be forced to, to store un content that I don't want to have on my hard disk in order to to participate in the system, this can uh, make it less acceptable by, by the users. But most importantly, there are also some legal issues. Um, so what, is, what if this is not only unwanted content, but really illegal content? So as, we, as I will show, the, we argue that the content is easily extractable from the blockchain. So if I um, store the transactions that uh, save such content, um, then as a node operator, I have control over it because if I know the transaction where content is stored, I can just look it up and easily extract the content from this. And um, what we did is to, to have a look at um, the legal situation with uh, respect to especially German law. So I have to uh, put a disclaimer here that we are not aware of any, any court rulings or so. But what we uh, did is we looked at how law is practiced in Germany and um, came up with a strong sense that there is a potential that, uh, at least in Germany, you can become culpable for, for storing the blockchain once it has illegal content on it. Um, we did this analysis uh, based on um, what if there is some, uh, for example, child, uh, child abuse imagery stored on the blockchain. On one hand, because um, there's really strict laws that um, make discussions um, and um, arguing this easy for us and also it's uh, rightfully uh, among the most condemned contents um, all over the globe. And um, by briefly looking at uh, legal text from other jurisdictions, so we are aware that this is not in all cases comparable to German law, but um, similar, uh, similar things are uh, expected to, to be also problem in other jurisdictions that make up half the, uh, the network. So a single con instance of content may be a problem. And to briefly look at how easily we can insert content is to look at a, a blockchain a Bitcoin transaction. This is made up of, um, of inputs and outputs. Inputs authorize um, ownership of Bitcoin so I can transfer them. Um, and outputs um, represent the recipients. So they are made of Bitcoin addresses and basically we can uh, just put any data into this without the Bitcoin network being able to check them before they are about to be spent. So having a look at this, uh, at this sample uh, standard output, it ma is basically made up of, of a random looking hash in which an um, attacker could place any arbitrary value. So if we interpret this as ASCII, uh, as ASCII characters, we have a, a little bit of text here. So this is very technical. But um, there are also services that make it very easy to, to insert such content. So there is, for example, this um, crypto graffiti service that really has a web front end that allows me to enter some text and send some bitcoins to the operator and uh, this will end up on, on the blockchain. And as you can see here, there are also images that can be posted to this. Here's a bunch of services that, um, that we identified in our work that are range from very simple to very easy for the users to sophisticated content that uh, uh, protocols that can even span content over multiple transactions. So what we did um, uh, around a year ago was um, look at the full Bitcoin blockchain and extract files that were inserted by such services and also had a look of, uh, at, big, uh, at suspicious transactions that are big transactions that are likely to contain content. And, tried to derive files that, um, that match this, uh, that, that, that we can um, extract and uh, read using standard software. So what we found is that um, there are around um, 1,600 files that we could extract. So this can also be small text chunks. But um, uh, most importantly, there are also around 150 images. So this really shows the potential that we can really put um, 
images uh, into this. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so what we also found around 60 of those files were not inserted via some, uh, some services, but really um, by, by freelancing content inserters, so to say. What we then did was um, a manual classification of, um, of content to, to assess if, whether they may be objectionable. And uh, some of our findings are that there are some privacy violations or potential privacy violations. We found two instances of doxing where um, basically the whole identity of, of single users um, were um, opened up on the blockchain. We have like banking account numbers uh, and pins that were published on the blockchain and are stored there uh, non-revocably. And also we have this picture, so this is uh, also can be found on the internet, um, but um, it shows, shows some of the um, Bitcoin experts with their Twitter handles. But if you have also, um, if you are considering uh, um, that, that you may not be aware that this picture of you ends up on the blockchain, so you have really a privacy violation here. Also, we have politically sensitive contents, for example, um, WikiLeaks archive or pictures of um, Hong Kong riots. So this may be interpreted as uh, state secrets and in certain jurisdictions it's uh, against the law to possess them or distribute them. So this is also a highly sensitive topic, um, which leads us to condemned content. So there are some religious texts here which uh, may be condemned in some really strict um, uh, jurisdictions um, or extremist countries. Um, we also found borderline image um, that is up to discussion that the media took up uh, for their discussions and this might be a reason to make the blockchain illegal at least in Germany and um, links that um, given the text con uh, the, the, the text um, context m indicate that they uh, once pointed to child pornography that are the, on those links are um, embedded into the blockchain so this means that we need some means to prevent blockchain insertion from happening <clears throat> in the future and uh, in another work we had a look um, and considered related work uh, what is our design space to do so. So we identified four dimensions which is content centric, consensus centric, transaction centric and incentive centric countermeasures. So content centric means basically I put up a firewall against some content Consensus centric, we, we say, is that maybe you want to uh, open up the blockchain and uh, replace blocks that um, contain such content, um, which is a hard thing to do. Transaction centric is mean, means we harden transactions against this uh, simple manipulation. And um, incentive centric, we just make it expensive to do so. And um, considering our results, um, we have so, so this fire warning is really intuitive but ineffective because when you're your anti-virus scanner you update all the time and um, you don't ca you cannot do this with uh, all the blockchain nodes. Um, re this replaceable blocks are good for, for other systems but you cannot really uh, uh, um, use it for Bitcoin as it is. You could extend it using this self, -identif uh, self verifying identifiers, but make it hard, but it also comes at a high overhead and this many mandatory minimum fees. This is promising because we can, um, uh, because we don't affect most of the Bitcoin transactions, but we can make it simple to insert content specifically. So concluding the first part, um, such content is irrevocable from the blockchain once it's inserted and this can become a problem. And, um, but we, there are means to, to prevent content insertion and make it uh, costly at a large scale. So, and with this, I would like to hand over to Martin for the second part of the talk. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about ongoing work that we are um, doing right now to address the scalability issues um, of increasing blockchain uh, sizes, especially uh, considering Bitcoin. Um, so this is a plot that essentially just shows how the uh, size of the blockchain evolves over time. Um, so we see a steady growth. Actually, we are more or less heading capacity. So there's uh, more or less a linear line um, during the last uh, few months. Um, and we are now at nearly 200 gigabytes that um, essentially each node that wants uh, to act as a full node and full nodes are important 
uh, to ensure um, that the system operates correctly has to store. And it's about 150 uh, megabytes of data uh, that come each day. Um, and this uh, obviously is a problem because you have to store all these things, you have to, uh, to transfer all these things. Um, when you want to join the system as a new node, you, you need to download all this stuff and then you need uh, to verify everything in there. So it takes a lot of uh, processing time uh, in order to get up to speed. Um, so there are other blockchains that um, address this issue, but uh, for Bitcoin it's really hard because you have this legacy system and what are you going to do about that? Um, and this is because essentially the blockchain is a trust anchor. So by synchronizing that is essentially revisiting the whole history of the blockchain, um, you actually have a guarantee that everything that happened is correct. Um, but if you think about that, Bitcoin essentially is just a financial system, meaning it just models transfer of assets or money from one entity to the other. Um, a lot of that information actually becomes obsolete. Um, because if uh, I transfer one Bitcoin to Andreas and Andreas um, then transfers one Bitcoin to Roman, then it doesn't really matter um, that this first transaction took place uh, once the funds are at Roman's. Um, so essentially you only need uh, the current state what is uh, in Bitcoin called the uns uh, unspent transaction output set, so which you could think about um, as account balances essentially just says who is allowed to spend how many bitcoins. Um, and if you have that information, it's actually enough uh, to be able to verify anything that's going to happen in the future if you know that this information is correct. So the question that we are asking ourselves is, is it possible to synchronize um, just having like a recent state or snapshot of the system um, by ensuring um, both trust and compatibility um, with the system? Um, so well, let us look a bit about how that could work. Um, so here we have the blockchain and at some point uh, some miner decides that now would be a good idea to create a snapshot in order to allow others later on to synchronize faster. So essentially you would just uh, take the state um, and save it in some form um, to disk um, and then you just uh, build a hash and you announce the hash of the state um, in the block that you recently mined. Um, then later on, um, the other miners, uh, they will confirm that this state that you created uh, is correct. That is, um, it corresponds um, to this um, block um, uh, 47,013, um, and this is what everyone agrees on is correct. Um, you can do that with a soft fork. Um, that means um, miners that don't support that will just report nothing um, and it doesn't harm. Um, like once you have that, the question is just like how do you distribute the state? So how does it get to others? Um, so we think about two ways uh, how you can do that. Uh, the one is the very straightforward and very efficient thing. You just say we put it somewhere and everyone can download it. Um, it could be distributed by a content um, distribution network um, or whatever you like. But this of course is a centralized thing that could be taken down. The other thing is um, it's very easily possible to extend the Bitcoin network um, to allow to distribute the state over the Bitcoin P2P network, where you then have um, content distribution in a P2P fashion. Um, it's potentially slower, but of course it's uh, fully decentralized. Okay, so once you're able to retrieve the state and now you're a node uh, that wants to join the system without having to download 200 gigabytes of data, the question is, if somebody gives you the state, how do you know that it's the correct state? Um, so the state tells you to which block it corresponds. So the first thing um, that you would do um, is you would download only the header portion of the blockchain, which is uh, way less than 1% of the blockchain, which essentially just is linking together the blocks. And you need to, to verify the proof of work that went into that, which is cheap because it's just um, doing hash operations, in order to figure out that you're on the correct blockchain. So actually you want to know the state that I got, does it go back to the genesis block um, of the Bitcoin blockchain? So this is the first thing that you can do. Um, that's a cheap operation. You do not have to download much data for that. Um, so the second thing is, is that state that I got correct? So again, you would now look at 
the blocks that came after the state was created and have a look if the other miners attested um, with their proof of work that the state has been cor uh, done correctly. And then the other thing is that the state is just a snapshot, so there are new things happen and you want to keep up. Um, and for that, you would then keep downloading um, the full coming blocks in order to be able to apply the changes that happen there um, to the state that you have. And so if you take the state and everything that's happened past the snapshot, uh, you actually have a fully synchronized node and the information that you have available is the same as if you would have done a full synchronization. Okay, so but how much saving does it give you? Um, so here again, you see the Bitcoin blockchain size and now it's a logarithmic scale so that you're going to see what's going to happen. And here is what you see if you serialize um, this UTXO set that is just the current state that you actually need. Um, so for very recent data, um, you see that you can take this uh, 190 gigabytes and turn it into a three gigabyte snapshot of information that are actually relevant. Um, so if you have like a sliding window of all, um, like all the um, blockchain history, you see it's about one to two uh, orders of magnitude uh, that you have as a saving potential. Perhaps more interesting is um, what does it mean for the synchronization time? Um, so we measured that for different block heights. Um, how long does it take on a commodity system to synchronize the blockchain? Again, it's um, a logarithmic scale. Um, so what you see here is standard Bitcoin. Um, and then we have um, a system that is allowed to use a snapshot to synchronize. Um, and what you can see instead of nearly uh, one and a half days, um, or nearly two days, um, you can have a compaction within about 20 minutes. Um, and like on average, it gives you about one order of magnitude um, of time savings for synchronizing for a new node. Okay, to summarize what I just told you, um, there is a steady increase in blockchain, so the problem is getting worse and worse. Um, and at some point, um, it will be infeasible for a lot of people uh, to participate as a full node because of storage, bandwidth, or processing power restrictions. Um, and a special problem is that for new nodes, the time is going to increase for synchronizing. So if you take these snapshots in order to synchronize, um, it's a very straightforward, simple idea, but it, of course, poses trust issues because you need to know that the state someone you provides is correct. Um, but if you do so, you can improve in, um, existing systems like the Bitcoin blockchain without having to come up with a new blockchain system. Um, and there's a high potential to actually mitigate these scalability issues because you can synchronize in the order of minutes and you just ha have to transfer about three gigabytes of data. Okay, so wrapping up our presentation, um, we have seen in, in Roman's part that blockchain content is actively being inserted and this content can be harmful in many ways. Um, but we have some mitigations or countermeasures that we can employ at least to make the life of potential malicious people harder. Um, and then we've seen that um, we have the scalability issues with the blockchain size, um, but we can overcome that with taking the snapshots and making sure that the snapshots are correct. Um, of course, we just touched some of the um, problems that we have um, and we only briefly talked about how to address them. Um, so we will head directly over to the panel, I guess, um, and then we will have plenty of opportunities to talk um, about other weaknesses, about other challenges and what we can do to make the blockchains uh, more efficient. Thank you. <laughs>